Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to another keynote first day of the Library 2.013 conference. Lee Rainey is with us, our closing keynote for the first day. Lee, thanks so much for being here. And Lee's in the hallway of a hotel, and there may be a slight lag. So I'm going to move the slides forward. Thanks so much to our conference sponsors and supporters. A great appreciation to San Jose State University as the founding partner for the conference to follow for support this year, Blackbird Collaborate and Red for promotional and other support. And thanks to the great organizations that have come on as conference partners. Many more on the website. This is um, this event is being featured at Connected Educator Month. So that means you can actually get a badge if you're participating in Connected Educator Month. So at the end of the session, I'll show the same slide with uh, the information you can get a badge. This is a chance for those of you who are in the room at this time to indicate where you're participating from. Look for the star to the left of the right board, the second icon down. Click on the map. And in the chat, maybe put your actual location, time, temperature. Yeah, it's a little bit echoey, I think, because Lee's microphone is on. But when when uh, he turns the, when I turn the time over to him, I think it will be a little bit better. Looks like it's my time to begin. I'm delighted to be here uh, at this important and interesting event. Uh, many of you who have heard me speak in, in American contexts know that the Pew Internet Project believes that any day we spend with librarians is a better day. And we're, I'm especially pleased that we have the kind of international audience that is evident here, and I hope the new data that I will be presenting about some of our research about the role of li libraries in their communities will be useful to people. The Pew Internet and American Life Project is one of the seven divisions of the Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C. We are, we call ourselves a fact tank rather than a think tank because we are not policy entrepreneurs in the same way that think tank researchers are. In the think tanks that I know best in my home town of Washington, D.C., they see problems in the world and they try to think up solutions to those problems and then aggressively promote those solutions to the problems. They are very much in the business of advocacy and making strong recommendations about the direction of our culture. On the other hand, we at Pew Internet and at the Pew Research Center more generally describe ourselves as a fact tank because we do not do any advocacy. We are not in business to change the world. We do not orient our research to try to prove that any thing is right or wrong or better or worse. In the particular case of the Pew Internet Project, what that means is that we do not take a stand on net neutrality. We do not consider ourselves cheerleaders for the Internet. We do not say which companies are good or bad. We are not even cheerleaders for libraries and librarians. We do a lot of research that we hope will be useful to the policy community and especially to the library community. But we do it with the spirit that we are providing useful information rather than we are trying to change how you do your jobs and how libraries exist in their community. The word Pew in our name, the Pew Internet Project, comes from our main supporters, financial supporters at the Pew Charitable Trust. Pew is a family name. It's not an acronym. It's a family name of uh, the person who discovered oil in Pennsylvania in the late 19th century, roughly at the time that Mr. Rockefeller was discovering oil in Ohio. 
Mr. Pew drove a lot of it out of the uh, ground in Pennsylvania and shipped it around the world. When his wealth passed along to his children, they created a large philanthropy, a U.S. charity that is in an interesting place in American culture. And when the founder of the philanthropy, the Pew Charitable Trust, was asked what was the philosophy of the, of the charitable giving that this organization would do, his simple phrase was, tell the truth and trust the people. And so I put some links on this slide to allow you to see more about the Pew Charitable Trust and more about the origins of the foundation. And I want to be clear that, that Pew Internet and Pew Research um, are part of a larger enterprise run by the Pew Charitable Trust. There are some divisions of the Pew organization that do do lobbying and do want to change the world. But we sit in a different quarter of the Pew universe, and we are not part of the uh, advocacy enterprise that Pew does. And I stuck at the bottom of this slide the uh, logo of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has funded uh, a lot of our library-specific research, uh, some of which I will be talking about uh, in my presentation. I'm going to make six major points off our data and off my uh, encounters with librarians that I think speak to the major issues about how librarians and libraries function in their communities and how they are perceived in their communities. My six points are, are there on this slide. Number one is libraries are deeply appreciated at the community level. The second point I will make is that libraries have a public relations problem that would help them if they solved it in their communities. The third point I want to make is libraries are well used by some groups and are quite removed from other groups. In other words, there is not a uniform demographic pattern to library use and library and, and people's views about libraries in their communities. There are quite diverse opinions and usage patterns in our data. The fourth point I want to make is libraries have a mandate to intervene in their communities. At least in the American context, there are data from US citizens about the things that they would like libraries to do heading into the future. The fifth point I want to make is the, the signals about what people want in the future from their libraries. In other words, they understand that libraries are in transition, but the signals they are sending in our data and in other data I'm aware of are quite mixed. There is not a clear, uniform public demand for specific kinds of services at libraries. And so it's, a, it's an interesting period of transition to libraries. And that leads to my sixth point, which is that the reinvention of libraries is what I call a community contact sport. In many respects, communities are hoping that you, librarians and library aficionados, will resolve many of the issues that now you face and that they, the public and patrons, will love them. But there are ways that you can interact with your communities and ask them to help you figure out the new world that they want you to inhabit. And that's this, this final point that I'm, I'm looking to make. So let's start with this first point. Library, libraries are deeply appreciated in their communities. When we ask Americans about the role of libraries in their lives and in their communities, the evidence is overpowering how much they appreciate them. As you see here, 91% of Americans who are age 16 and older, and we took a big nationally representative survey using cell phones as well as landline phones. So this is representative of the entire population of age 16 year old and over in the, in the United States. 91% say libraries are important to their communities, and 76% say libraries are important to them and their families. Uh, it's interesting to me in these data that the community answer is even higher than the personal answer about libraries, about me and my family. And one of the things that I've begun to understand in our research is that people love their libraries most for what the library says about their community. They appreciate the fact that libraries have a special civic role in their communities. 
They appreciate the fact that libraries serve many, many patrons in their communities who don't necessarily have lots of advantages or lots of resources to access the kinds of things that libraries make available. They, in effect, libraries level the playing field for communities. And having a good library is a very strong mark of pride for many Americans. So that's why they're saying that libraries as community institutions are so important and so meaningful to them. But it's, of course, not trivial to note that three quarters say that libraries are important to them and their families. And even inside families, we see that there is evidence that some people are more heavy users of libraries than others. And so family members are saying, I, I might not be the most active patron of a library in my own life, but I know it matters to others who are in my household, my kids, my spouse, my parent who's living with us. And so there are ways that this ripple effect about the sort of goodwill that libraries have and the services that they provide for entire communities is a very important marker of why people think libraries are, are important. We have just completed a very large survey of people aged 16 and older in the United States. We have not yet released the data, but I wanted to share with you some of the um, attitudinal answers that people gave when, when we asked them to say whether they agreed or disagreed with certain statements about the role of libraries in the world. And there is overwhelming evidence in our data that people agree with the statement that having a public library improves the quality of life in a community. Again, this speaks to the large issue about people sensing that libraries are important for, the, for what they stand for about how our community takes care of everyone, how our community tries to address the needs of all different kinds of population. And so there's this overall sense that libraries are big contributors to the quality of life in a community. The second point that we asked about, and again, many, many people agreed with the statement, public libraries are important because they promote literacy and a love of reading. Later on in the presentation, I will talk a lot about how parents are especially appreciative of libraries. And when I say parents, I mean people who have children under the age of 18 in their households. And one of the most important things that they believe that libraries do for their families and for the broader community is they promote literacy and a love of reading. There's just this powerful sense in our data that people think that, that reading is essential to life in, in, the, in the knowledge age and that there are new sets of literacies that people need to master in addition to reading and writing and, and comprehending text that they are now are added to these literacy requirements um, through the capacity to effectively use technology and to be facile with technology. So there's, a, again, a sense in this answer that when libraries are doing the work of promoting literacy and the love of reading, they are doing incredibly important uh, community Steve business. Steve here. The next point that people agree with is because it's required. Uh, every once in a while, your voice really fades. I don't know if you're turning away from the computer. There's anything else you can do for it. If not, don't worry about it. I just wanted you to know. Great. Thanks. I'm trying not to. I'm trying to be very close to the, to the microphone, but I will be even more vigilant about that. The third point that um, the agreement, we, we gave this statement, and many Americans agreed with this statement, because it provides free access to materials and resources, the public library plays an important role in giving everyone a chance to succeed. This underlines the point I was making earlier about how libraries are seen to be uh, institutions that level the playing field for all kinds of people and communities. And they serve diverse populations and say so they play an important role about giving everyone opportunities and everyone a chance to have the same advantages that the better off and better educated people in a community have. So there's lots of agreement with, uh, with this statement. Finally, there was lots of agreement with uh, the statement, public libraries provide many services people would have a hard time finding elsewhere. Again, there's this very palpable sense in, in these attitudinal answers that 
people in communities have a belief that not everyone in the community enjoys equal advantages and that libraries fill gaps and bridge divides and address uh, sort of differences that might otherwise be disadvantages to people. So again, they really appreciate libraries giving opportunities to lots of people. And then they very violently disagreed with this statement, public libraries have not done a good job keeping up with new technologies. Most people say that's not true. I'll point out some other data later on about how appreciative people are in getting information that libraries have embraced technology and have added technology to their their sort of offerings to their community. So we also you'll notice in these questions that we try to mix up positive assertions and negative assertions so that we didn't fall into the uh, habit of some pollsters of only asking questions with the with the wording that we hoped that would be useful to the recipients of, the, of this research. We asked both negative and positive questions, and it was interesting that people were very consistent. They, they weren't just checking off boxes as they went through the questionnaire or they went through it with a, our researchers. They were actually carefully listening and carefully answering to um, these questions. And finally, there, there was one question where there was a division. There was, there was a split verdict, as I call it, when we made this assertion. People do not need public libraries as much as they used to because they can find most information on their own. So about half of respondents agreed with this statement and half of the respondents disagreed. So there, there wasn't an overwhelming sense that libraries might be irrelevant or libraries might have sort of passed their time of usefulness. But there was definitely a, a, a more mixed verdict when we asked people to agree or disagree with this statement. When I presented the data about the very positive attitudes that people have about libraries in their communities, a standard question comes up. Well, if people like us so much, how do we compare to other categories of people or other kinds of institutions? We don't ask a lot about other institutions in this particular work we've been doing, but Pew does ask about uh, trust in institutions, and actually today, earlier today, several hours ago, released findings that after the debacle of the um, problems in Washington and the stalemate over whether the government should be funded or not, people's trust in government has plunged, and so we, we published those data in another form uh, earlier in the day today. But I gathered together these data from the Gallup polling organization that talk about how confident people are in other institutions making good decisions and serving needs. And so you'll see at the very top of the Gallup list, which is the green um, data that I've highlighted here, the United States military has the most confidence uh, of the public. And it, right at the bottom, the US Congress has the least confidence. And these were last year numbers. These were uh, the summer of 2012 numbers. And so my guess is that some of these numbers have gotten even worse for some institutions in the intervening year. And you will remember from the previous slide that uh, my question um, when we in our survey was how important are libraries. So we don't ask quite the same question that the Gallup people do. We don't ask how confident people are. But we do ask about how important libraries are. And you'll see that the community answer about libraries being important to their communities, libraries outrank every other institution in terms of public um, you know, popularity and public perception of importance. Again, I want to point out these are different questions with slightly different frameworks for their answers. But again, librarians ought to be very, very proud of how the, the brand of the library and the community role of the institution of the library and in such high public esteem. The one other group that, that sort of has similar levels of high levels of approval are local firefighters, those first responders who, you know, with like and men that fight fires. And so libraries stand in the same level of public esteem as firefighters, which is a, is a really good place to be. Another question that we, a battery of questions that we ask about the role of libraries in communities involves 
um, how the perception of librarians themselves. And there, there, you will see in these data that there are overwhelming evidence that people like what happens at libraries and like what happens to them themselves at libraries. They say that their encounters are very or mostly positive at libraries. Uh, you never see in a poll that 98% of people say something, so this is an amazing achievement. 81% of library visitors say librarians are very helpful. And in the past year, 50% uh, 50 uh, 50 of the general public got help from a librarian. It's hard to think of another institution, particularly a public institution, that has the same level of contact with the public, but with the public that librarians do. And so again, it, it, it speaks to how community-based, how forward-facing, how rooted in community circumstances librarians are. We also ask people, um, what, what are very important functions for libraries to play? And, and again, this speaks to some of the community-based issues that I was discussing before. But you see here, 80% of Americans say that borrowing books is a very important service that libraries provide. 80% say reference librarians are a very important service that libraries provide. But right there at the same level, and there's no statistically meaningful difference between 80% and 77% in this survey, 77% of people say free access to computers and the internet is a very important service that libraries provide. So and, 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 and in terms of rebranding yourselves, libraries have done a very wonderful job in, in embracing new technology, making sure it's available to the public, making sure that everybody has the same access to it. And it's quite a striking story that just in the past 15 years, as technology has been brought into libraries, that this now ranks as one of the most important functions that libraries do, and it ranks as important as the traditional things of allowing people to borrow books and get, providing reference librarians to help people. And right there at the same level is that final answer, 76% of Americans say that libraries offering quiet study spaces is a very important service. So there are paradoxes or there are tensions in these data. At the same time, people are telling you, we like that you provide computers and free internet access. They're also saying, we love the fact that this is a quiet sanctuary in our community where people can escape, in many respects, from technology and the sort of always present, always on demands of, of technology. When I, and just these are data that I know are useful to librarians as they uh, try to assess uh, the provision of technology in their, in their institutions. About 26% of Americans say that in the past 12 months they've used free internet access at the library in one way, shape, or, or another. And here are the activities that they do. They, they do research for school and work. They browse the internet for fun to pass the time, so just the active connectivity is an important thing that libraries provide. A lot of people are using email. Um, and interestingly enough, right there in the fourth bullet is 47% of those who use computers and technology used them in the past year to get health information. So it's a very important instrumental activity that people are doing as they um, are using those, those days of computers at libraries. Right below that is they visit government websites or get information. I suspect that a lot of libraries are seeing in the past two weeks people are using um, computers at libraries to explore uh, medical insurance exchanges, one of the new elements of the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare Act. And, and so this is a common thing that people do at libraries. They get uh, information off government websites. Um, there's been a lot of activity, particularly since the Great Recession started, about people using library computers to look for jobs and apply for jobs online. So many jobs now depend on people making applications and filing their resumes online that this is a, a, an increasingly important thing that the technology at libraries are affording people. Then there are folks who do social networking sites, so again, just back to some of that fun level. There are people who download videos or watch videos. There are people who buy things using library computers. That was one of the surprising uh, numbers to me. And they do online banking there. And then this final answer is so interesting because I think it's going to grow over time. 
15% of the people who used technology in the past year took an online class or completed an online certification program. And this intersection between libraries and learning activities, and intersections with, with, uh, between a library and the school system, or library, local universities, or community colleges, or things like that, is a very important part of the uh, public imagination about the role of libraries in their world. Okay, so that's, uh, that's my point number one. I'm on to point number two, which is that libraries have a public relations problem. And in our data, um, many of the people who patronize libraries and who are fond of libraries can answer what I call the Marvin Gay question, which is, what's going on? 22% of the people in, a, in, in our survey said they had, they did, they, I'm sorry, said that they did know all or most of the services that their libraries offer. So about a fifth of people feel well informed about libraries. But about half the people say that they know some of what libraries offer. So about, about half are, are sort of in tune with libraries, but they're not fully in tune. And a third of people say they know not much or nothing at all about what their libraries offer. So there are significant batches of people in communities who do not have a sense of all of the, the things that you guys offer. I think part of the answer for that is that they do have a sense that libraries have been reinventing themselves and have been changing their offerings and, and, and they're appreciative, but they're not necessarily sure anymore of, of all of the things that you offer. But other people uh, just have a sense that they um, uh, that there is something going on with libraries, and they are not necessarily uh, tuned into what it is. So this slide shows um, how librarians can do outreach. How libraries can do outreach to populations that already like you. If this is not a hard sales job in the sense that you are trying to convert the opinions and the behaviors of people who don't like you. In fact, this is, this is actually talking to people who say that they do the things that matter to you, or they say that libraries themselves matter to you. So what the slide shows in the far left is that 53% of those who are age 16 and older used a library or a library bookmobile in the past month. If you add the extra people who have only gone to library websites but have not gone to the building, that number bumps up to about 59%. Um, so you know it's, it's significant that more than half of the population uses the physical library or uses the website of libraries. But there's a 22% gap. There's a 22 percentage point gap between the people who use libraries and the people who read a book in the past 12 months. And that's not what that next bar, the second bar, shows. There's a 23 point gap between people who say the library is important to me and my family and the number of people who actually went to a library last year. There's a 31 point gap between the people who ever visited a library ever in their life and the people who went last year. And there's a 38 point gap between people who say the library is important to my community and actually went to a library last year. So the sales job or the marketing job that libraries have in front of them to, to make sure that their constituencies and their potential patrons know what's going on is, is, is not an easy one, but it's, it's not the case that libraries are going to have to convince hostile people that they have value and that there, there are things going on at the library that they might want to take advantage of. There are lots of people already who are affectionate towards libraries, but just don't necessarily go in any given 12-month uh, period. So there, there are just interesting things to note in the gap between patronage and enthusiasm, at least in attitude. Now I'm on to my third point. Libraries are well used by some groups and quite removed from others. This is uh, a, a more elaborate demographic breakdown of that 53% number. So right at the top there, 53% of Americans age 16 and older used the library in the past 12 months. Women were much more likely, statistically significantly more likely than men, to have used the library. I highlight that 40% number for older Americans because they are statistically significantly unlikely to have visited libraries last year. Just 40% of the senior citizens in your communities have had a library engagement um, with a, either the building or a bookmobile. It's interesting to note that uh, 
that the, some of the heaviest patronage comes from some of the young adults uh, in, in community. So this notion that young adults don't read, that young adults don't like libraries, that young adults are civically disconnected is not really shown up in, in at least these data. Then if you go down to the, to the block that talks about educational attainment, these show that people who have higher levels of education are much more likely to have visited a library in the past 12 months. And then that final data point is one I mentioned earlier. Parents of minor children are significantly more likely than non-parents to use libraries. The, the story about how affectionate parents are, how dependent they are, how uh, enthusiastic they are, how appreciative they are, is, is shows up in all of our data. Parents are special people to libraries. And particularly as you engage your communities, as you do maybe extra marketing work, as you are thinking about the constituencies who will talk up about and promote and evangelize for the role of libraries, parents of minor children are especially important and especially meaningful. And even more so, mothers, more than fathers, are the ones who are the library enthusiasts and the library even evangelicals who will um, you will speak up for you and, and be gladly uh, help promote and market some of the things that are going on at libraries, especially the stuff that, that they are enthusiastic about. I'm sorry that this slide is so tiny, uh, but I give it to you mostly so that you have data to go back to your libraries and ponder about who uses uh, library websites. 39% uh, of Americans have used a library website one time at least in their lives. Many use them, of course, many times, but at least once, 39% have. And 25% of Americans have visited a library website in the past year. And again, you can see when there are check marks or when there are superscript letters here, that means that those are statistically significant differences with other categories. Women are more likely to use websites than men. Younger folks are more likely to use websites than older folks. Uh, whites are a bit more likely to use websites than African Americans. Um, uh, those who are well off in, uh, in their household income, those who are relatively well educated are also likely to use library websites. Again, the parent numbers are uh, incredibly meaningful here. And the rural numbers are also pretty interesting because they show that, um, that for websites especially, um, the urban and suburban residents are more likely than rural residents to use websites. I think this speaks to some of the connectivity issues that are prevalent in rural communities. Uh, but it also speaks to the fact that rural libraries sometimes don't have um, all the resources they might need to have a really robust website or, or to spend money on that compared to the other resources that they feel it's important for them to provide. The, the next slide, slide, again, is demographic data about people who use mobile connections to go to libraries. In this data that we gathered last December, or last, late last year, about 1 in 10 Americans, 11% of Americans, have used a mobile device to connect to a library. Uh, again, women are more likely to use those devices than men. Even though they have the same level of ownership, women are more likely than men. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, Gen X, Gen Y folks are more likely to do it. Well-educated folks are, are likely to do it. And again, parents show up as a, as a sort of special, unique category of, of uh, website user. Um, this is the first time that we collected data about mobile connectivity to library websites. My guess is that when we do this again in the, in the next year, we will see growth because mobile devices are becoming increasingly important as access points for lots of people. They're obviously convenient. People now have a, a probably a better sense that libraries have websites that they could share. And so there, there are ways that, that this will just sort of naturally grow into a bigger portion of, of website traffic to library websites. And also a, a, a point of contact with libraries where people will be using their mobile devices. They won't necessarily feel like they have to go to the building Every time they want an interaction, they will use their, their mobile phone. My fourth point is that libraries have a mandate to intervene in their communities. That is most starkly evident in our data when we ask people about what they would like libraries to do. What, what was 
uh, what were things that libraries should definitely do, what were things that libraries maybe should do, what were things that uh, libraries should definitely not do. And the two most powerful and striking answers that we got were that people overwhelmingly want libraries to coordinate more closely with local schools in providing resources to, to children at schools. And the same number of people said they would like libraries to offer free early literacy programs to help young children prepare for school. That the, obviously the theme of this is that folks would like libraries to be in very consistent and deep contact with the local school systems. Some of the story here is that people hope that libraries can help fix uh, some of the problems at local school systems because they, they don't necessarily um, have a sense that the school systems are performing well. And they do have a sense that libraries are performing well. So they hope some of the magic that occurs at libraries might spill over into the school systems. But especially for parents, they also know but it's frustrating at times when their children get assignments at a local school and then they go to the library to check out a book or to check out resources that local schools have suggested. And the schools are completely, uh, I'm sorry, the libraries are completely unaware that those assignments have been given and they would have happily prepared for them if they'd gotten some early warning. And so there's a sense that this is, there are, are missed opportunities for, for these two critical community institutions to work with each other. And then in the literacy answer, what's clearly going on is that people not only sense that, that, that classic literacy is important, reading, writing, comprehension is, a, is an important thing for everybody to master, uh, but there's a, a palpable sense of, among respondents to our data that there is a new set of technology-based literacies that they hope their children will master, and that they hope that libraries will be involved in helping provide, it, it, again, sort of as you've rebranded as, as technology hubs and technology centers for your communities, this is a new kind of um, um, project that, that, that folks, not only parents, but other people in the community as well, they, they would hope that you would embrace because the mastery of new kinds of technology literacies is, is widely perceived to be a prerequisite for success for children in school and later on you know, as they get into the workplace. We also got other answers that more than majority, more than a majority of Americans also said libraries should definitely provide separate spaces for different services. One of our questions was, you know, as we as you walk through all of the things that, that libraries provide, what you know, is this something that's important? And what they're saying here is a simple thing. They don't want the gaming space or the teenage hangout space to be next to the quiet reading space. They just want a little separation between uh, functions of the library where there might be tensions or clashes and things like that. So it, it, again, the library sanctuary is a really important um, value that people want you guys to uphold, and they just want to make sure that, you, that and even as you're providing new services, that some of those quiet sanctuary spaces don't get uh, slammed up against some of the more active community spaces in libraries. And that speaks to that next answer. Most people want more comfortable spaces for reading, working, and relaxing. So that bears attention right there. And then people would like a broader selection of e-books. I know this is such a huge struggle for libraries as they are trying to work with publishers and figure out what the business model is and what the lending model is, what the licensing model is. Uh, but there are now growing numbers of people who have e-book readers and have tablet computers and would love to have lots of library, uh, you know, lots of capacity to borrow from the library uh, some of those books that they really like. You might also note that if you go to our website at pewinternet.org, just today we released new findings about, about the level of ownership of, of tablet, tablet computers and e-book readers. Now, 35% of Americans have a tablet and 24% have an e-book reader. These are bigger numbers from the uh, tail end of 2012. There will be bigger numbers after the holiday gift giving season this year. And so there, you know, these numbers will continue to rise, and so the, the interest in e-books will continue to get even more intense. 
My fifth point is that uh, the signals about what the public wants in the future from libraries are mixed. We asked the, uh, a series of questions about what would you like libraries to do, and the answer around which we got the most divided opinion was, what do you do with the books? Would you like libraries to free up more space for such things as tech centers, reading rooms, meeting rooms, and cultural events, maybe move some of the printed books and the, and the stacks? Uh, out of the uh, public space at libraries, only 20% of Americans said they, you, that libraries should definitely do this, 39% libraries should maybe do this, and 36% said don't do it at all. Um, and th there was no other question we asked where there was this level of division and, and, and sort of uncertainty about what was ahead. It's absolutely meaningful that 20%, a fifth of library patrons, would like um, you know, more, uh, more space configured in a different way at libraries. That, that number is probably considerably higher from if anybody had asked that question in the pre-internet age. And so you can't ignore it. But there are obviously ways in which the, the books at libraries are such a central defining aspect of what the library means that if you start fooling around with it a lot, there are a lot of patrons who will not be happy with it. And I'm sure you already know who they are. You've already heard from them as you've been doing your own strategic reviews. Then we asked about a series of questions about what would you, if libraries instituted these programs, what would you be very likely to embrace? What would you be somewhat likely to embrace? What would you not be likely to embrace or not at all likely to embrace? And um, the answers fell into a, a variety of ca categories. Um, about a third of people, or a little bit more, said they'd like online ask a librarian services. They would like a cell app for use to get access to library services. So that, you know, apps would become a big part of the mobile experience. A lot of people said they would like to be able to test run or try out um, new gadgets and new devices to have, kind of have a petting zoo at the library so they could check out the newest gadgets and applications. Uh, a lot of people say they would like a cell phone app that would help them nav navigate the library spell space itself. The, the, the prevalence and prominence of, of mapping functions and in-store uh, activities has now sort of transferred over to people. You know, a portion of people say they would love an app that help them get around the library space. And if, uh, about a third said that they would like kiosks and, and the style of red book kiosks, red box kiosks, that would uh, be scattered around town and not necessarily mean that people would have to go to the library to get things that they wanted to check out. And then there were other people who said that they'd like uh, librarians and libraries to offer personalized Amazon style recommendations. There are lots of people, or not lots of people, but there are a portion of people who say they would definitely go to classes on how to download ebooks, on how, and the bottom line, uh, classes on how to um, use ebook readers in the first place. There are a portion of people who would love to have ebook uh, readers that are preloaded with material that they could use. And there are a portion of people who say they would like digital media labs so that they could organize some of their, their family uh, artifacts um, in, in, in reorganizing those digital spaces. So uh, maybe I'm going to go back for a minute. If you look at the middle category here, the people who say they were, would be somewhat likely to use these services, if I were a political consultant, I would consider those the undecided voters. And they might be the people to talk to most avidly as libraries are thinking about changing their roles and changing their services. It's, it's, those are the people who will give you probably the most powerful signals about what, what they really would like if you offered it, as opposed to stuff that they might not really care about, even if you, you know, killed yourself to, to offer it to them. So as you're engaging your community, trying to figure out who are those in-between people? Who are those undecided voters? They'll probably help you sort out some of the maze of questions that you ask yourself about um, what services should we add to our mix, what services should we throttle back on, and what services might be possible, but we don't really think our patrons will necessarily be very appreciative of that. OK, so I'm going to my uh, final point here. And, and it flows from that last point. Reinvention is a community contact sport. You will not get clear answers in 
our data or even your own surveys about what priorities people would have, about what services they'd like you to have, what reconfigurations of your buildings they'd like you to have. It's a pretty mushy picture where people would like lots of things, but they don't have um, necessarily highly prioritized preferences. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is about um, things that are happening in communities or not happening in communities that libraries might be um, well advised to think about serving. So there are, as I call these market shortcomings or cultural shortcomings in, in some communities. And here's my list of eight. I'm sure you can come up with other examples on this. I, I think that there are ways for libraries to address the needs of non-users of technology. About 15% of American adults do not use the Internet. And thinking about offering skills training programs, they obviously understand that libraries have become tech centers in their community, so that would be a need libraries could serve. Obviously, those preschool programs that I referred to before, there are ways that, um, that libraries can think about in serving those needs. One of the biggest um, sort of gaps in, in the time frame of some communities, or particularly in some children's lives, is what happens to them after school, uh, when they check out, when they leave. And I know that there are hosts of libraries that are now thinking that offering special after school based programs would really enhance their role in the community and really meet some needs in their communities. Uh, I know other libraries are offering that fourth point, English as a second language uh, uh, courses and issues that, that's obviously a need in lots of communities. There is, uh, down to the fifth point here, there are ways that communities now, uh, libraries have, have picked up evidence that people appreciate in ways that they never did before the Great Recession. They've got to keep up to date with their skills. They want to stay in touch with, with new developments in their communities. And so the, the act of, of offering lifelong uh, learning opportunities might be a real way for libraries to cement their needs in communities. And one of the things that would go along with that, of course, is credentialing. I mean, one of the things that employers will want to know is if, if you took a lifelong learning course or if you tried to get extra skills um, by self-paced learning, uh, maybe libraries could, could work with credentialing institutions to figure out how to certify that someone actually is competent in a skill. Uh, the sixth point here is, is one that's near to my heart because it comes from the, the troubles that local newspapers are having. Local newspapers played a critically important uh, civic role in their communities for covering city hall, covering the school board, covering the zoning commission, talking about what was going on at school, talking about what was happening uh, in local you know, uh, real estate developments and things like that. Well, as that coverage has diminished, as, as the business model of newspapers has struggled, and as things are getting cut back at local institutions, one of the main types of news that is not getting covered as much anymore is local civic information. And so I'm thinking that libraries can either work with local news media or think about other civically minded institutions and individuals to help fill in some of the holes that the troubled newspapers have created in communities. Now my second point is that there are lots of local institutions, starting with small businesses, um, that, um, that need the kinds of things that libraries are expert at. They need information. They need help making decisions. They need they have to, how to figure out how to um, uh, market themselves. They need to figure out where new patrons might come from. They need to figure out the, the process for getting permits and other other technical things for their businesses. Well, library, I know a lot of libraries have begun to offer things like small business help desk, literally a dedicated librarian or a series of librarians who help small businesses uh, get out their way. And the same kind of um, sentiment could apply for um, for nonprofits. And finally, this this eighth point of mine is, is again so it's near dear to my heart. One of the things that is happening less and less in the world is as people are feel overwhelmed by information, is how do you make sure that people learn about really great stuff that they wouldn't normally learn about in their in the normal course of, of navigating the internet or navigating news sources or things like this. I, I think of librarians as being especially adept at being serendipitous agents of discovery. You, you will love this book. You will be interested in this article. You will find um, you know, interesting websites if you go to these places. 
uh, this role of sort of filling in where people might not necessarily um, know that they have interest, but librarians have a special intuitive sense about what's delightful, what's entertaining, what's important for people to know, and I would encourage you to think aggressively about that role in your communities. So my final point in here is that in the midst of all of this transition, libraries are particularly well suited to serve their community needs and to serve their patrons. And so it's, it's an environment where you shouldn't necessarily be afraid, in part because every other institution I know about, every other professional group I know about, is struggling with the same cluster of questions about how do we deal with disruption, how do we change and adapt to a world where the basic provision of information, the sharing of information, the creation of information and knowledge is changing. I'm so glad that, um, that librarians are deeply in these conversations already, and I'm just adding my final word of encouragement to you to keep at it because this is important for us to do. And my final thought, I'd really like to take a few questions here at the end. These are people who do the library work at the Pew Internet Project. We would actually love librarians to sign up to take some surveys and, and participate in focus groups of ours. There's a place on our website, uh, this libraries, pewinternet.org website, where you can sign up to participate in our work and give us advice and give us insights. So I hope you'll do that. But I'll turn it back over to you, Steve, maybe to see if there are questions that um, sort of Please, I tried to take the questions that came up and I put them in the moderator tab in the chat. And so unfortunately there may be a little bit of lost context, but I think you'll figure them out. If you click at the bottom of the chat on the moderator tab, you can see the questions that came up. If you have a question, Great. Uh, okay. Yeah, before before you do school, some, school libraries. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Our work with the Gates Foundation uh, did not cover school libraries. It was it was covering um, public libraries. But we um, we we know how important school libraries are to their to their communities and their institutions. We know that it's a struggle. Uh, we're hoping we can get more funding to do some dedicated work about the value of that. And I just gave a presentation today to, um, to some school librarians in Texas, and I would be happy for people to write me to ask for a copy of my presentation because it, it speaks to some particular issues about the role of libraries with, with teenagers and young adults in, in schools. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the Sally's question about community content creation collaborators. I, 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 we don't have data on this, but I know um, there are lots of libraries that now are, are, because they're so expert in social media, because they are building maker spaces, this is a really interesting role that libraries are taking on, and I think that it will grow over time, and I think the public will appreciate it. They, they won't actually express their appreciation until they see it offered, but my guess is they will be pretty enthusiastic about it. Um, Yes, uh, that's, uh, Linda, my slide about um, computer activities, that they did those things in libraries using library computers. That's what that slide was about. Um, uh, online library users, well, I gave that data about, um, about people using library websites, but we have not um, uh, collected uh, particular use about about online uh, library users beyond those website users. I know that's an important new development in the field, and I'm uh, I'm hoping we will be able to sort of add some precision to what's going on. And but I'm not. Uh, we haven't done it yet, and I'm not quite sure when we'll get to it. Um, and then Sally asked a question about is the survey size statistically significant? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we do the most rigorous kinds of scientific research. The fact that we're talking to 2,000 Americans actually is a very big poll. The political polls that people get in their local news organizations tend to be of less than 1,000 voters. We're talking to 2,000 people, and our methods um, are, are, are professionally sanctioned by the polling fraternity. They have, have been proven over generations to answer um, the kind of questions that we're asking. Uh, the Gates Foundation gave us some, this money because they knew we do this at the highest level of rigor and seriousness, and and so um, I'm uh, I, I'm very confident that our data are are very accurate and statistically significant. Um, 
Uh, yeah, we would love if someone would just be about um, non librarian, uh, not uh, American librarian. And so we would love that. We, uh, you know, some of the most interesting uh, innovations that are occurring in libraries are taking place uh, outside of America. And, and the American, you know, you, John, if you interact with American librarians, they're hungry for insight into this. So dealing with us and giving your insights would be great. And sharing those practices or sharing stories about uh, what you're doing in New Zealand would be amazingly appreciated. And, and anybody else from the uh, from the non-American audience that's participating in this, um, not only would Pew be interested in your work, but, but sharing it broadly and highlighting the stuff that you do to the American audience, uh, the American librarians would love you for that. Literally, I think that's really, you I remember did the great, questions there. Skip, you did a great skip, job. Uh, we've tried, we're trying to make an effort to allow people a little bit of a break between the session hours. So I think this is a good place to stop. I'm going to clap for you here. So the clap for you hover over the smiley face icon and then look for the applause. What, what a delight to hear from you again. Thanks so much for, for doing this in, in uh, less than ideal circumstances. I'm really sorry that the technology didn't work. I, I, I'm just um, I, I'm, I'm very sorry for that. And I hope people hung with it and, and were um, as, as, as tolerant as librarians always tend to be about such things. Thanks a lot. Yeah. In no way should you feel like it didn't work. It definitely did work. Everything worked fine, but I know you're sitting out in the hallway. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll go ahead and close this session and encourage you, if you if you have time, to go to the, the one of the sessions coming up in the next hour. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.